I believe it. If it's not, I don't need it. Amen to that. I encourage you, take notes. Write things down. If you see a Bible verse that you come across that's really important or meaningful to you, make a point to memorize that Bible verse. Try to, try to put that Bible verse in your heart. Let God's Word saturate you, satisfy you. The Bible talks about how God's Word is, is even more important than our necessary food. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Get this Word in your heart, and you will be satisfied. Before we begin our message tonight, would you bow your heads with me in prayer? My Father in heaven, I just want to lift up uh, all of those right now who are not feeling too well. My sister mentioned June she is, is, needs uh, a touch from you. There's also uh, Brandy's kids, and there's so many others, God, that right now that are just not feeling the best. And I ask that, Lord, you would lay your healing hand on them and bring them to full recovery. I, in fact, I know uh, to my mind now there's several more people that are just in need right now of your special touch. But Lord, tonight as we study your word, we are in need also of a spiritual touch from heaven that your spirit would move on our hearts and lead us and guide us into all truth. God, we want truth. We don't want to be deceived in these last days. We want to stand tall for you to the very end. May we be your people here in these last days doing your will and your way and your, to please you in all things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. My message tonight is Revelation Reveals the Mark of the Beast. Now, I'm going to begin by uh, giving a kind of a, a disclaimer, a little bit of a warning. This message can possibly offend you. In fact, most Bible messages, if preached faithfully, can be offensive and probably will be offensive, certainly, to some people. Now, the Bible says... In Romans chapter 9, verse 33, as it's written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of what? A face. This is talking about Jesus, by the way. And whoever believes on him, Jesus will not be put to shame. But this same Jesus is a rock of offense to a lot of people. You even say the name Jesus. In fact, just, what was this? Just the other day, I guess um, somebody was sharing with me that Coca-Cola has this new feature where you can add, put somebody's name on a can before it comes out of the, the, um, the soda machine or whatever. And so you type it in the screen, somebody's name, and personalize a can of soda. And the person on there, they put on there, Allah loves you. It was just fine. Buddha loves you. Perfectly fine. Jesus, beep, 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 not allowed. Unacceptable. Not permitted. You can't use the name of Jesus on the this, this software. It gets flagged. It's offensive. It could hurt somebody's feelings. Now, I know that we are in the last days when the name of Jesus causes offense to people, but Jesus said it would happen. In fact, in Galatians 4, verse 16, Paul says, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I have unfortunately lost friends over Bible teachings. Now, I don't like that. I don't, I, if you've got to know me a little bit. You know I'm a friendly person. I, I don't like to offend. In fact, I, I find confrontation, confrontation very uncomfortable. You want, you want to argue with me? I'm like, no, nah, I'm not really interested in arguing. I'll discuss the Bible. We can have different viewpoints, and we'll talk about the Word. But when you start getting arguments and heated and just your feelings get involved and people start getting upset, I just want to step back. I'm not, I'm not interested in all that. But unfortunately, people draw the line pretty heavy sometimes, and they're not willing to listen. And so, I, I mean, I've lost friends over the issue of evolution. I've, there, there are Christian ministers out there who teach that God used evolution to make human beings. That there was death for millions of years before sin. That's what they say. And I, just, and I, and I, and I, I tell them, look, the Bible just doesn't teach that. Well, then you just, and they just throw their hand up and think I'm some kind of heretic for teaching what the Bible teaches. I don't like doing that, but the Bible will cause offense. It happens. Now, I'm going to go to a place in the book of Revelation where God gives a very serious and sober warning for these last days. Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation 14. In fact, I encourage, if you got my text message, I encourage you to read Revelation 13 kind of as a preview tonight because that's where we are going to be. Does God love this world? 
He does. But out of love, God gives a warning message. And we find it in Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 14 here in these last days. Now, uh, Revelation 14 verse 6, we're going to start there because he kind of paints the picture of the danger of getting the mark of the beast. Let's just kind of get a running start by looking at what's called the first angel's message. I got the numbers in the corner so you can kind of follow along which angel we're talking about. This is the first angel's message, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. It's here. So first of all, let me just say, this is the everlasting gospel. Are we talking about something that's a salvational issue? Absolutely. This is a judgment message. It's a message to fear God. It's a message to give glory to Him. But notice this part of the message. It says, And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This is a worldwide message in the last days to worship God as what? The Creator. Worship the one who made you. God knew in the last days the whole world will be tempted to get their eyes off of the Creator, so He puts in Revelation a warning message to say, don't forget to worship God as the maker of heaven and earth and of the sea and of the fountains of waters. This is important because in just in a moment we're going to talk about how the beast wants your worship. So that's the first angel's message, warning you to worship the Creator. The second angel's message Revelation 14, 8, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Read this twice here. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We have a message coming up a week from tonight that's going to talk about Babylon. Who is Babylon? Who, what is she doing? Why is she fallen? What's that cup she's drinking? What's in that cup? What, why is she dressed the way she is? What is she riding, the beast she's riding? We're going to go through all of that next week at the same time. But, so we're going to talk about why is, why is Babylon fallen? Why is she fallen and fallen? There's two fallens here. Why is that? That's not the focus of tonight. But it's leading us right to the third angel's message. This third angel's message is a message that says, sorry, my clicker's not obeying me tonight. There it is. Okay. Oh, there it is. And the third angel, so this is our third angel's message, follow them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, it says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone uh, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, there's a lot in here. I mean, there's so much packed in here. But let me just make a couple of things clear. Number one. If you receive the mark of the beast, you're going to be lost. Eternally lost. You think God wants us to get the mark of the beast? He could not have expressed it in more strong language than this. Don't get the mark of the beast. If you get the mark of the beast, you get the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. We're talking about the, the full strength stuff here. And you're going to be tormented. You're going to be destroyed with fire and brimstone. That's the language of the lake of fire. We're going to look at this next Friday. So, God says, don't get the mark of the beast. I think nobody in their right mind is asking for the mark of the beast. Nobody says, sign me up. I want the mark of the beast, especially not believers. And there might be some people out there in the world that are just outright, I don't know, either insane. Maybe they just don't like Christians. They're like, I'll do the mark of the beast. Give it to me. Just because they're that, that way. You've met people probably like that. But generally speaking, people don't want the mark of the beast. God doesn't want you to have it. But here's the question. Why would God warn us in such strong language not to get the mark of the beast and then say, I'm not telling you what it is. You're just going to have to wonder and guess. I believe the Bible gives enough information to answer this question. What is the mark of the beast? What is the mark of the beast? Now, a lot of people think the mark of the beast is 666. I'll talk about it more later, but the mark of the beast is not 666. That is the number of the beast. We'll see that in Scripture here in just a minute. That the Bible separates those two things. So people don't want to know, what is it? Well, there was a time, and I'm looking around and seeing some gray heads tonight. 
when the barcode first came out. Do you remember, just think back, when, do you remember when the barcodes first started hitting the store shelves on the products? I, well, I got to admit, I wasn't around, but I have read stories about it. And I am told that in the Christian communities, there was a little bit of turmoil because there was a, there was a thought that, you know, that those first two lines and the middle two lines and last two lines that, that surround the barcode, that they are, that, that those numbers represent the number six. And therefore, in every barcode, you had 666. Now, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's just some sick joke from the barcode industry who did that, or if it just makes practical sense to do it, or if it's not even the way it is. But I'll tell you this, I can be assured that this is not the mark of the beast. And, and I'll tell you one thing, if it is the mark of the beast, we all have it. Right now, you're wearing clothes that you bought that were scanned with the mark of, with, with the, mark of the beast, <laughs> with the barcode. Uh, you're, you have a phone that, has, that was scanned when you bought it with the barcode. Every, you, bought, you bought books. You bought food. In fact, I'm, you cannot go to the store. You can't shop at any grocery store without beep, beep. Now you've got to do it yourself even. Talk about the mark of the beast. No. Was, you know, you've got to check it out. And so is the barcode the mark of the beast? The answer is no, and I'll tell you why here in just a little bit. Here's the most popular view right now among Christians about what the mark of the beast is. People, Christians think the mark of the beast is a subliminal, or su, sub, yeah, not subliminal, a uh, subdermal implant, right, under your skin implant. It's a, it's a chip. It's a microchip. It goes under your skin, and it's either going to be in your right hand or it's going to be in your forehead, and that's what the mark of the beast is going to be. Now, that's what most people teach today, but I don't believe this is it. And I'm going to give you, I think, conclusive evidence tonight that's going to dismiss this as a possibility of being the mark of the beast. Okay? So don't, don't judge me too, you know, too harshly yet. Wait till you hear the evidence first. There are some who says... Chrome, if you're using a Chrome browser on your computer, it's the mark of the beast. Why? Because you have, see how the 666 is kind of built into it? That's what some people say. Other people say, if you watch any Disney movies or you go to a Disney theme park, you've got the mark of the beast. Why? Because C666 is built right into the logo of Disney. Now, I'm no fan of Disney. Everything Disney does is witchcraft, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's not good for your kids. It's all about, uh, you know, in fact, follow your heart. That's, a, that's the center. When I was, used to be in the Church of Satan, that was kind of the center of our theology, so to speak. Follow your heart. And that's what you hear in all these Disney movies. Follow your heart. I grew up on Disney. I know this. I know all about the, the, the magic wands and, and Mickey Mouse and all that stuff. Anyway, I don't believe this is the mark of the beast. Now, this one got pretty clever. You, have you heard this one before? This one is really interesting. So they say the monster energy drink if you've ever drunk any of those, you've got the mark of the beast. And here's why they reason. They say that the, uh, the, the three claw marks you see there, right? It's supposed to be a monster doing this. Well, in the Hebrew language, you have, you have different characters. And, you know, in, in, in English doesn't really do this too often, but there's uh, something that most languages have called gematria. Every letter represents a number. In fact, if you... Or if you speak Hebrew or have the Hebrew language, you don't have separate numbers. You actually have the letters of the alphabet. Now, the modern Hebrew might be different. But the, but the alphabet here, you can see Aleph, Bet, Gamil, Daleth, He. And then that, that sixth letter is the letter Va. It's the letter Va. Va, it looks like that it's claw mark, doesn't it? And they say the Va, 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 which in Hebrew the, amounts up to 666. And look, and look, look at that subtext right there. It says, unleash the what? Beast. Now, I do not believe, now, there, you, know, you know, this drink has killed kids. There's like lawsuits out there for people, kids overdosing with caffeine and all these things. But get this, as bad as it is, and I don't recommend it for anybody, it is certainly not the mark of the beast. But why, but why this, all this imagery? Let me tell you, Satan is sick. And two things. First of all, I think he wants to distract people. And second of all, I think he wants to mock Christianity. And he's trying to put this kind of foolishness everywhere so as to get people's minds in different places. Now, the latest, well, not the latest, the second latest uh, idea of what the mark of the beast is, is they say it is the COVID-19 vaccine. I probably shouldn't even say that because it gets taken down from YouTube. Right? It's, the, it's the jab. 
Is this the mark of the beast? Well, a lot of people, I'm telling you, when, I, when this was going on and the heat of it, and you kind of got, you know, you saw it. If you were watching the news at all, people divided over this issue. I mean, it's divided churches, it divided schools, it divided communities together, divided families, you know. You're evil for not getting it. Well, you're evil for getting it. And it just, it's just the, the hate and the vitriol, I just saw it all, you know. And so, uh, but here's the, here's the thing. People are saying, I'm not getting it because it's the mark of the beast. And there's come all these conspiracy theories about it, and, you know, and, but I'll tell you this, and, it, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to divide anybody in this room, so I'm not going to really get all political on this, but I'll tell you, um, whether this is the best thing for you or the worst thing for you, it's missing something if it was going to be an issue of the mark of the beast. So, how? I, I am uh, treading on thin water here. I'm just going to tell you this. We need to think before we put things in our body. I'll just say that. Use our, not just our common sense, but do our research before putting stuff in our bodies. And our bodies are sacred. Our body, the Bible calls our bodies the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So we need to be careful. But I will say, first of all, where do they put this injection in people when they get them? Is it in their right hand or their forehead? They put it in their arm. I say, well, then it flows to the right hand or forehead. I'll tell you, people really stretch things out to make it into the mark of the beast. But I'm going to tell you something. Even if it was bad for you, it is not the mark of the beast. And again, I'll talk to you uh, in a minute more about why that is. But the latest teaching about what the mark of the beast is, is that the mark of the beast is AI. That there's going to be artificial intelligence somehow affecting us. And, and I, I, I've heard a couple different uh, theories about how this can lead to the mark of the beast. And if you are playing around with AI or using AI, you're going to get the mark of the beast. Now, all of these things lack something that the Bible says is at the center of the mark of the beast issue. You know what that is? You guys are already on ball. Worship. The mark of the beast issue is an issue of worship. In fact, worship is in Revelation 15 times, especially in chapter 13 and 14, right? And, and this, is the, this is the focal point of this mark of the beast issue is an issue of worship. Does Jesus want us to worship him in just in spirit? Does he want us to worship him in truth? He says, those that worship me will worship me in spirit and truth. God is looking for such to worship him in these last days. The central issue regarding the mark of the beast is an issue of worship. And that's what's going to happen. In the last days, you're going to have uh, 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 all the false and all the good, uh, all, all, all the false and all the truth is going to come in collision in the last days. And you, every one of you, are going to be in the hot seat. And you're going to have to answer for what is truth. Because you don't want to be found falsely worshiping in the last day, like Cain and Abel, right? Did, who did Cain worship? I'm just going to ask, who did Cain worship? The true God. Well, ultimately, right? You see, my sister here says himself, and that's true. But he believed with all of his heart he was worshiping the true God. If you would ask Cain, I mean, he would have been, you know, the first to church to... It was probably a small church back in his day, you know, but, uh, but he would have been the first in church to, to, to be up front like the Pharisees saying, I give tithes of all I possess, and I, you know, fast twice a week, and all these things. And Jesus, of course, cut, you know, told the person that, that was up front in the church all proud that he wouldn't be saved. It was a sinner outside that was beating his chest and wouldn't even look up to heaven and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the one who's be saved. But the point is, is that both of these worshipers were in church. One in the front church. No offense to my people in the front. I like people in the front. I really do. Uh, but, you know, we don't do it arrogantly, right? But the fact is, just because you go to church doesn't mean you're worshiping God. Too often, the worship, and worship is not about me. I've heard people say, oh, I didn't like worship today. Worship didn't bless me today. I didn't get much out of worship. Well, let's pause for a second. Worship isn't about me. <laughs> Nobody came to church to worship me. Worship is about God. It's about focusing on Him. Now, a couple things about the mark of the beast. First of all, the mark of the beast is not 666. The Bible says that, in fact, it mentions the number of the beast, the name of the beast, and the mark of the beast. Three separate things that we need to be aware of. Next, it's not a chip. It's not a chip. And it's not physical. Now, let me, let me illustrate to you why. This is, this, you want to know why this will not work? I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a very clear illustration for you. I want you to imagine that 
the time came to enforce the mark of the beast. And I want you just to imagine for a moment it is a microchip. And so the police force, all their military uniforms, they come knocking on my door and they say, time to get this chip. This chip is for good. You're good. This chip is for the national security. This chip is for national unity. All these different, whatever excuses they make, it's time for you to get yours. And I say, I, I say politely, because I'm a Christian, no thank you. And they say to me, uh, we weren't asking. We're going to give you this. And I'm like, no, you're not. I I'm, do not want this in me, right? You're not putting anything under my skin. And they said, look, if you don't do this, we're going to kill your family. That's pretty serious, right? And I said, you know what? God will take care of my family. God will take care of me. Next thing I know, they whack me across the head. I'm knocked out on the floor. I wake up, and what do I find under my wrist? They put the chip in me when I was knocked out asleep. Here's my question. If that chip was the mark of the beast, do I have the mark of the beast? Why not? Because there was no choice involved. You, to worship, you have to have choice. Now, let's, 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 re, let's uh, do a different scenario. Let's say my neighbor, he's not a Christian, doesn't love God, doesn't love his neighbor. He's just a mean, old, cantankerous, curmudgeon neighbor. You may got one like that? We're supposed to love them, but they don't love you very much. Well, let's just say the government comes and knocks on his door. And he pulls out his gun and says, you get off my lawn. And so they back off, and they say, all right, well, we're going we're gonna to leave Mr. Curmudgeon alone, right? And so he doesn't get the chip. You see, he doesn't, he doesn't get it, the physical chip in his hand. Here's my question. Does he then not have the mark of the beast, or is it impossible for him to not get it? You, you follow what I'm saying? Just because he says, I don't want it, and by force refuses to get it, doesn't mean he won't get the mark of the beast because the mark of the beast is not a physical mark. It's something that every, think about this, everybody in the world is going to have either the mark of the beast or the seal of God, one or the other, everybody. If you're not a worshiper of Jesus Christ actively receiving the seal of God, you are going to get the mark of the beast. Even if you have a gun and says, I don't want it, you're still going to get it because it's not a matter of a physical item in your body. It's a matter of a decision that you make. Somebody, oh, by the way, I forgot about this. Does anybody have one of these? Go ahead and, go ahead and hold up your phone here. Anybody, you, you may got one. Just pull it out. Hold it up. You got it? Put it in your right hand. Right now, you have a chip in your right hand. Do you not? You have a chip in your right hand. If this is the mark of the beast, we all got it, don't we? But this is not the mark of the beast. Uh, so I just, just, if anybody ever questions, say, I think this is the mark of the beast. And you look, that's in your right hand. Yeah, you'll freak somebody out. But... Anyway, the phone is not the mark of the beast. The chips, you got lots of chips. You got all kinds of chips in that phone, right? And then you, people, you look at it all day long, so where's it going? In your brain. As bad as it might be, it's not the mark of the beast. So how do we understand what this mark of the beast issue is? If it's a matter of choice, it's a matter of worship, let's examine the scriptures in the light of that truth, and let's discover what the mark of the beast is and what it's not. And I'll tell you, finding out what the seal of God is, is actually going to be the first step toward understanding the mark of the beast. So Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7 goes on. We read this just a little bit ago. It says, Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. There, this, this Bible verse is an actual quote. Can anybody recognize where this quote is from out of the Old Testament? Exodus, yes. Now get, no, notice this. Out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, over 200 of them, over half of them, were found in the Old Testament, or allusions to them from the Old Testament. This is one that's actually more than just an allusion. This is a direct quote from the Old Testament. And the book is the book of Exodus, chapter 20, where you see the Ten Commandments, and verse 8 through 11, where he says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor, do all thy work, for the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and it, thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that's within thy gates. It's a mouthful. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, right? Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. 
We worship God because He's our Maker. That's why God gave the Sabbath to remind us that He is our Maker. So Revelation reveals two different groups. One group who worships God as the Creator, and then one group that worships the beast. The first angel's message is a message to worship the Creator. The third angel's message is a warning message against worshiping the beast. Now, how do we know this for sure, that, the, that God's bringing our attention to the commandments? Well, notice, after he mentions the three angels' messages, don't get the mark of the beast, he says, look, there's a group of people who don't get the mark of the beast. What do these group of people look like? He says, I'm going to show you the group of people who don't have the mark of the beast. Right here it is, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Literally, that word patience there, that Greek word is the word for endurance, those who don't give up, those who don't give in. It says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Are you getting it? Revelation tells us there's a group of people who don't get the mark of the beast, and the way they don't get it is because they're loyal to God's law. They're obeying to the very end. What's the basis of all true worship? It is that God is our creator. Revelation 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. God deserves your worship because He made you, because He saved you. You can read this again, Psalm 95. Psalm 104, Romans chapter 1, goes into great detail about God as our creator, therefore worthy of our worship. In fact, it talks about how people got away from true worship when they forgot that God was the creator. Has God given us a memorial of true worship? Has God given us something to say, this is a sign of true worship to me? Has God left a sign of his creative authority? I believe the answer is yes. I just read it to you. This is the sign, friends. He puts it right in the heart of the Ten Commandments. The sign of loyalty to God in the last days, he gives it here, is the Sabbath commandment. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth a sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Sorry, I skipped off the first part. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The one commandment that God said remember is the one that all humanity has forgotten. Oh, let me say that again, but make it more personal. The one commandment that God said, remember, is the one the church has forgotten. Can I make it even more personal yet? The one commandment that God said, remember, is the one that we, I, have forgotten. Oh, Lord, save us. The basis of our worship is that God is our creator. And so, friends, when we move away, and Satan knows this, but when we move away and we start breaking the Sabbath, we're moving away from true worship. Notice Ezekiel 20 and verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. The Sabbath is a what? It's a sign. It's a, it's a sign that identifies God's true people. Think about it. All throughout history, God has had a people. And he said, look, I want you to know who my people are. Look for the ones that are keeping the Sabbath. It was there in the Old Testament. It was there among the apostles. It was there in the New Testament church in the book of Acts and on. And it's still the same today. God has had a people identified. And by the way, the Sabbath isn't the only. I'm not trying to identify the Sabbath as the only sign. I think God has all of his law, his loyalty to his whole law, as a way to separate his people from the world. But the Sabbath becomes a very unique one because you know what? You ever heard of the law of Hammurabi? There, there are pagan laws out there that were written that says don't kill and don't steal and don't lie. Pagan communities out there that says those are bad things, don't do it. I would say pretty much we're living in a pretty pagan and secular society today and it's wrong to steal. It's wrong to lie. It's wrong to kill. But you know what sets God's law apart? Is God says, I've got a special day. The world doesn't have that. The pagan, yeah, now the pagans, they do have their own special day, but it's a counterfeit day. But God says, I have my day to identify my people so you don't have to be confused. Notice that the word seal, the sign is the same as a seal, is the same as a mark in the Bible. He was, this is now, he talks, he's talking about circumcision. But he says he received the sign of circumcision, a seal 
of the righteousness of faith. They're in Romans chapter 4, verse 11. The point being is that when you see a sign in the Bible, it's the same as a seal. There's another verse that identifies those seals as a mark. So mark, seal, sign, talking about the same thing. So when we come to Revelation chapter 7, watch this. This is blow your minds. Revelation chapter 7, 2 and 3, he says, actually, let me back up just a second. Revelation chapter 6. This chapter identifies, uh, it's, it's the sixth chapter. Uh, seal that's being un, 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 unsealed, and basically what it is, it's the, the coming of Christ, the coming of Jesus, and there's a group of people that they, they look up in the sky and they say, uh, you know, uh, it says, they hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? It says, who's going to stand in the last days? Who's, everybody else is going to bow down, everybody else is going to flee and run. Who's going to stand in the last days? Well, Revelation chapter 7 tells you these are the people who are going to stand. Okay? And then he describes them. He says, He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their what? You notice here, God's people, God's last day people, the people who are alive to see Jesus come back, the ones who are standing when everybody else is fleeing, this group of people are sealed with a seal. Where are they sealed at? In the forehead. And you'll notice, I'm going to come back a little bit later and explain why the forehead. But you notice that God's last day people are not sealed in the hand. It doesn't mention that. It mentions that God's people are sealed in the forehead, but that the mark of the beast is in the forehead or the the hand. Again, I'll, I'll talk about why in a little bit. So you have really only two choices in the last days. You have the seal of God or you have the mark of the beast. When we're worshiping, now here, okay, let me make, I'm going to try to make this as simple as can be. If you worship the beast in the beast's way, you will get the mark of the beast. If you worship God in his way, you will get the seal of God. I think already we know we need to worship God in his way to do it the way God said do it. So to identify the mark of the beast, we must identify the seal of God. What is the seal of the living God? Isaiah 8, verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. God gave us his law as a seal to... Now, we think about what a seal is. Anciently, a seal was how you would take a document, an official document. I don't know if you ever been married before. I did this. I, I actually, I have brought my marriage certificate to these meetings before. I, I have my marriage certificate. There it is on it. A seal from the county of Cole in Missouri that is testifying that my wife and I are going to be married. It's a seal from the, the county, who was this? The county commissioner, county clerk, somebody, county clerk maybe, who put a seal on there. And uh, it shows that it's authentic, right? It's authenticating this document. You actually see this in Esther chapter 8, verse 8. Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring, for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. Remember when Jesus was taken into the, um, the tomb when he died? They put a Roman seal on that to say, do not tamper with this. You know, at least until that next Sunday, right? This was to be sealed up because they didn't want to have, remember they came to uh, Pilate and said, hey, they're going to steal his body away, seal that thing up. And so he had that tomb sealed. So a seal, notice a couple things about it, identifies who's in charge. Secondly, it shows ownership. Thirdly, it protects and holds things together. If you have a, a jar of pickles, right? You want to be sure when you get that jar of pickles, it is sealed when you get it, right? So when you open it, what does it do? You know, it just pops open, right? You, don't, you want to hear the pop. If you, if you get a new jar of pickles and you don't get that pop, then that seal has already been broken. That seal is designed for what? To protect you. By the way, sometimes that sealing process is not the most comfortable. You want to seal, seal a can of, uh, you, you ever, anybody, anybody do any canning or jarring, right? You got to put it in some hot water, <laughs> That sealing process is not the most comfortable. Sometimes usually involves some heat. But in this case, God wants to seal his people. He wants to protect us. He wants to uh, identify us as his own. It's his, his ownership of us. And it, it identifies that he's in charge over us. Remember, the one who does the sealing is above the one who's sealed. 
That's why it says he sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. We've got to have a place of an attitude of a servant. God wants us to come there. So notice a few elements of every seal that you see. First of all, you have a seal that will reveal a name. So every seal has a name on it. And then you have a title on the seal. And you have a territory on a seal. You see those three things? Let me give you an example. I don't remember the lady's name, but it, on the seal I had with my marriage certificate, it had her name, it had her title, and the county that she had authority over. Uh, one day, I hope to get a pardon from the Missouri governor. If anybody has any connections with the Missouri governor, let me know. And I hope to get a pardon and have some kind of government seal on that pardon that has his name, his title, and his territory over the whole state of Missouri. That would be a wonderful thing to have. And so, in president, you know, president of the United States, you know, the current president, Joe Biden, uh, whether you like him or not, he's got a seal, and that seal would be his name, and then his title, president of the United States, and then the area of the United States of America, right? So that would be his seal. Does God have a seal? He does, and it's right in the heart of the Ten Commandments. You've already seen it, but, I, but I, you may not have noticed it. Here's his seal. Watch this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. Of, watch this now. The Lord your God. Now that word, when you see the word Lord capitalized in your Bibles, do you realize it's not, uh, it's not the original word was Lord? It was actually God's sacred name. Did you know this? When you see it capitalized, it's usually in um, the first letters fully caps, and then O-R-D is small caps. When you see that, that was God's original Hebrew name. In Hebrew, it was yod He va He, right? In Hebrew, it went from right to left. And so there's different pronunciations. You've heard Jehovah, which there's no J originally, so it's probably not Jehovah. But then you have Yehovah, Yahovah, and some say Yahweh would be, how do you say God's name? I'm not really sure. Uh, somebody said Yahovah. I heard that one as well. There's several different ones. And there's other ideas, but I, we could talk about it afterward. But there's, uh, you know, the thing is, I, don't, I think God's less concerned about pronunciation as he is to obedience and submission to him and his name representing his character. I'm not trying to get too off the point here, but this was God's name in the Ten Commandments. Right here in the heart of the Ten Commandments, he said, The Lord your God, for in six days the Lord, Jehovah, made heaven and earth. Did you see that? You got his name. His title, which is maker, creator, his territory, heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And rest of the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So you have these three, these three uh, points in the Ten Commandments, in the fourth of the Ten Commandments. And I, and I think it's beautiful because you read the Ten Commandments. And at the end of the day, you ask, well, who's telling me to do these things? By whose authority are you telling me I've got to do what this says? Right here in the seal is God's name, title, and territory authenticating it, saying, this is me, the one over heaven and earth, saying to obey. Saying to obey the rest of the commandments as well. And I will say this too, by the way. There, of the Ten Commandments, a dead person can keep eight of them. Dead people don't lie or steal or take God's name in vain. They don't covet. They don't worship false gods. Dead people don't do this. Two of the commandments act, involve actively going forward. The Sabbath commandment involves you actively keeping it. You don't just accidentally stumble into keeping the Sabbath. I mean, I suppose one day you may sleep all day on Saturday, but that's not keeping the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath is entering into God's rest. Right? It's, yes, it's laying aside your secular work, but it's also worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's coming together as a church family. The Bible says the Sabbath is a day of convocation, a day when we come together. It's a day of fellowshipping. It's a day where we encourage and edify one another. So I, I can get into that another time. But another act of commandment that Jesus talks about uh, is honor your father and mother. That takes an act of work. So God's seal stands in contrast to the beast's mark. So as we understand the seal of God, we're going to better understand what the mark of the beast is. Notice again, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, this is the new covenant experience. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I'll be their God and they shall be my people. That's the experience of the new covenant. That's what the Sabbath is all about, that we come into that relationship with God, spending that time with him 
Building that relationship so that his law is written in our heart. Remember this, very important. The Ten Commandments on stone may be helpful to point out your sin, but it really doesn't do you much good as far as obeying the Ten Commandments. God wants to write his law on your heart so you naturally do it. It, it kind of works like this. Um, let me ask, is anybody today, when they, when they first got your driver's license, you remember how you had to study that book, your driver's ed book, and you had to study it really good, learn your signs, learn your... Well, do you, anybody still have that book in their glove box? You know, that, 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 that one you had to study. Is it still there in your glove box? When you pull up to a red light, do you pull it out of the glove box and d just double check what that red light means? You see, there's a difference here between the driver's ed book in your glove box and in your heart. I hope, if I'm out there on the same roads driving that you're driving on, I hope that you have the driver's ed book in your heart. So that when you see a red light, you don't have to stop and think about it. Wait a minute, now what was I supposed to do again? But you, you put your foot on the brake and it just naturally, you don't even think about it. You could be in the middle of a conversation. You could be, uh, whatever you're doing, your mind is immediately doing this. It's so natural. I, uh, when I first married my wife, my, uh, we got an apartment way out in the country. It was, a, it was a duplex, but it was way out in the country. And you had to go around these bendy turns. Well, there's this one turn that literally was like a 90 degree, like just like that. And I can't tell you how many times as we're, you know, we're in love, talking, we're newlyweds, and we're just talking away. And I turn my turn signal on, just turning a bend. I turn my left turn signal on like all the time, she'll tell you. And it's like, um, you wasn't an actual stop turn thing, but you know, just how your mind knows you're turning left. You ever done that before? Am I the only one to turn your turn signal on just because you're kind of in that auto mode? That's the, how God wants us to be with his law. He doesn't want us to stop and think, hmm, should I tell a lie? Let me weigh the pros and cons of telling this lie. No, he wants you to be like, no, don't lie. Lying's wrong. It's always wrong. It always will be wrong. He wants us to have that experience. And so that's what God wants to do is write his law in our hearts and in our minds. But Satan, he wants to twist God's law so the wrong law is written on your heart. You know, what, what, if, what if some nefarious person out there slipped you the wrong driver's ed book that said green is stop and red is go? Would you feel comfortable about that? I mean, if you found out about that, you'd be pretty upset, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, the man who baptized me told me a story about his dad after he found out the things that I'm sharing with you, he got so mad, he went up to his preacher and about punched him out for lying to him for all these years. Now, he learned better over time, but uh, most of these preachers out there, they're not lying out of malice. They just don't know any better, right? But I would be pretty upset if I found out somebody slipped me the wrong driver's ed book because that's, that's deadly. I, and so I see a red light, I push the gas even harder. I see a green light, I stop. That's going to create problems. That's going to create accidents. Satan wants us to have the wrong things written on our heart. And that's why we see in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, and verse 25, and that Satan, the Antichrist, shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Now, if you were not here during my message on the Antichrist, and you don't know who the Antichrist is, you don't know who the beast of Bible prophecy is, this may throw you for a loop a little bit, but to understand the mark of the beast, you need to understand the beast, right? And uh, so I encourage you, get the lessons, get the study guides, go back and watch the videos. Um, you really need to understand this because it was the Antichrist who started tampering with God's commandments, his laws. That's why we have Sunday keeping and other things out there. So here's the question. Since the final issue revolves around, the, around worship, what earthly religious power claims that it has authority to change God's laws? Well, let's quote that, th uh, th that claim and see who's claiming it. Perhaps the bold, now this is St. Catherine's Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21, 1995. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century, which actually was actually the third century. But anyway, the holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. Hmm. The church having power to change it, not based on scripture, but by their own power? Friends, that is false. Here's another one. The Pope, according to this, uh, this, this the translation from this Pope, he said, the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. 
Friends, Satan has attacked the seal of God, the Sabbath, which is the basis of worship. Now again, now I, I say the Sabbath is the basis of worship. Worshiping God as the Creator is the basis of worship. The Sabbath was given to protect that basis of worship. So let's ask the question. We already know the answer. We went over it the other night. Who is the beast of Revelation 13? Who is this beast who has a mark of the beast? Because whoever this beast is, is the one who tampered with God's law. It's the one who is trying to get people to obey, false, uh, obey falsely. And, uh, and we've established, I think, again, I'm, I'm just going to lay it out here tonight, but we established really clearly that the Roman Catholic Church is the beast of Bible prophecy. God laid it out. He prophesied it. He said it. He told us in advance. He gave us all the key indicators and the markers that said whenever this, this, this church is going to rise up in my name falsely, and they're going to institute false laws. They're going to persecute God's people. It's going to rule for 1,260 years. It would uproot three kingdoms when it came to power. It would uh, it'd be a little kingdom. Um, all these different things. The papacy, whose headquarters is in Rome, would be the one that tries to change God's times and laws. And it would be the one that would have a mark that would be enforced. I want to show you something that you've always seen, but, you, but maybe you never caught. This is, if, you, if you haven't seen this before, it's just going to blow you away. The mark of the beast is the mark or the sign of the beast. Okay. <laughs> you say, I know you just said that. Let me say it again. The mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. We say the word mark of the beast so many times, we forget that it's talking about the beast himself. So we first have to identify who the beast is because it's a mark of the beast. Are you getting it? So all we have to do is ask, what is the mark of the Roman church? What's the mark of the Roman church's authority? And as soon as you ask that question, you're going to have the answer. Because the Roman Catholic church tells you what their mark is. What is their sign? What is their mark? We're going to see that tonight. We know what God's sign is. It's a sign of loyalty and obedience to all of His commandments, especially the fourth commandment. But now we come to the mark of the beast. First of all, is it a literal mark or a symbolic mark? Well, we have learned that the beast is a symbolic beast, right? It's not, there's no zoo in the last days that contains the beast that John saw. This is a symbolic beast. It's a symbolic image to the beast. It's a symbolic name. It's a symbolic number, a symbolic seal. And finally, it's a symbolic mark. So we have a symbolic mark of a symbolic beast. What is that symbol? What does it represent? This mark of the beast. You ready for it? You want to know what the mark of the beast is? Here it is. Catholic Church, you ask them, what is your, be what is your mark? Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act, changing from Saturday to Sunday, the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Here's an, here it is again, Catholic record, September 1st, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of this fact. Here's a more recent one from D.S. Domini. This is a... Uh, what Pope John Paul II wrote. It was one of those encyclicals that were supposedly God gave him to give to the people. He said, the Sunday assembly is the privileged place of unity and it profoundly marks the church as a people gathered by and in the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. goes on to say, Christians, called as they are to proclaim the liberation won by the blood of Christ, felt that they had the authority to transfer the meaning of the Sabbath from the day of the resurrection. So here you have a church who believes that it has authority to change God's law, and the fact that it changed, in their eyes, Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, says, that's our proof, that's our mark. You want to know that if we have authority? Look to Sunday. You want to know that we're in charge, that we're the right church, that we have authority? Look to Sunday. Sunday is our mark of authority. Here it is, Dictionary of the Liturgy. Uh, it says, this, forgive me for the clicking there. Distinctive of the Roman Catholic Church, Sunday Mass observance became a mark of a practicing Catholic. So, the fact that you have Protestants today that are observing Sunday, they're doing it without realizing it, 
in loyalty to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I don't, I have, just to be fair, I've never met a Sunday keeper or minister I've talked to and said, you know, you're honoring the Catholic Church. They're like, oh, I know that. I've never met a preacher who said that, okay? They're not aware of these things, but their, their practice is yet, in spite of what they know, is still in loyalty to the Catholic Church. Here's what a chancellor uh, of the Catholic Church said. Uh, he said, if Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping the Sunday, they're following a law of the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not trying to get too much in the weeds here, but I want to remind us the core issue of the last days is an issue of worship. Who's getting your worship? Please understand that the mark of the beast is simply the counterfeit papal Sabbath and the observance of Sunday, the first, which is the observance of Sunday, the, the first day of the week. Let me say this again. The mark of the beast is the counterfeit papal Sabbath, the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week. But here's, pause, put the brakes on, hold on. Somebody's going to, you're thinking this right now, if you're, you want to ask it, but you, you know, we're in the middle of the meeting. So you're telling me, pastor, that if I keep Sunday, I've got the mark of the beast. No. Say, well, you're talking out two sides of your mouth. Okay, let me, let me clarify something. The mark of the beast issue is a future issue. Okay? It's not happening right now. The fact that what the mark of the beast is in Sunday observance does not mean that anybody has the mark of the beast right now. In fact, I'll say it like this. No one will receive the mark of the beast until religious legislation is passed enforcing the substitute Sabbath. I want to pause for a minute. I want you to turn to the book of Revelation chapter 13. I want you to see for yourself what's happening here. And then we're going to, we're going to read all of Revelation 13 tonight. The first message tonight is the first part of Revelation. The second part is going to be... Uh, the, the second message is going to be the second part of Revelation 13, okay? So, Revelation 13, beginning in verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, or wounded unto death, the King James says. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast, or they wondered after the beast. Verse 4, so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So again, you see worship, worship, worship. That's what it's all about. And when you give, this is where people miss it. When you give the beast your worship, who is really getting your worship? The dragon is. Satan is. Satan doesn't need you to come and go to a church of Satan and bow down and give him homage. He doesn't need you to stand in a, in, in a seance circle and, or, or, or become a witch. Satan doesn't need all those things. I think he laughs about all the church of Satan and all these things. He laughs at those things. Satan doesn't care. He wants you to obey his commandments and not God's. And he, so he established this beast system to counterfeit Christianity. He gave laws to this counterfeit Christianity and says, if you worship the laws of this counterfeit Christianity, you're doing what I tell you to do. It says, if you worship the beast, you're really worshiping Satan. Now, most Christians don't realize this, and I'll tell you, most, most Satanists don't realize they are. When I, was in, when I was in the church of Satan, I knew I was a Satanist. But most Satanists, they don't realize it. They don't know that they're worshiping the devil. Now, I will say, I'm going to pause, and I'm going to be very clear in this statement. There is a point in which God knows the sincerity of the heart. God knows the genuineness of the heart. There are people today who are faithfully observing Sunday who don't know better. Now, Satan is, he, remember, he's setting up an end-time delusion, Okay. But right now, there are people that, that, that are in honest and in their integrity of doing what they believe is right. God judges people for what they know, not what they don't know. The book of Acts chapter 17, I believe it's verse 30, says, For the times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands men everywhere to repent. So we're not here to judge anybody out there in any church that are doing their things. I believe God has plenty, many spirit-filled, sanctified, uh, heaven-bound Christians in many different denominations and churches. You understand? You hear what I'm saying? But the time is coming, and there's going to be a final test for humanity. 
a test to say, will we obey God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, or with, with love, or will we obey the counterfeit commands and laws of Satan? That test is coming, and that's why I'm sharing these messages, to prepare the world for what's to take place. I'm just one cog in the, in the big machine, right? But I want to do my part to shout, to shout the message warning of Revelation chapter 14. Verse 5. Talking about the dragon, helping us, or sorry, the, the beast, helping us identify the beast. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's the 1,260 years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy, blasphemy against God, against his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. So again, the people who endure, the people who don't give in, the people who don't worship the beast, the one who have the patience and faith of the saints, these are the ones who stand tall amidst this enforcement. But here's the thing. The next beast, there's another beast, and we're going to talk about that in our next session. He's had two horns like a lamb. I'm going to skip down just a little bit, and I'm going to show you here. I have some scriptures on the screen here in a minute. I'll share with you as well. But here it says in verse 15, we'll read it again in a moment, but it says, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. It says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark, on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So again, we'll get more into this in just a moment. But this picture of this beast who wants your worship, and it's going to come down to the point it's going to be enforced by law. Until that law is passed, enforcing Sunday observance, nobody has the mark of the beast. Now, the mark of the beast is what it is, but nobody has it yet. And I would say... Even before the mark of the beast is enforced, you and I should be far away from it, so we're not tempted to give in to it out of pressure that we see coming. So, nobody has it right now. The Bible predicts a coming confederacy of religions attempting to unite church and state. And it's happening, by the way. I'm going to share some things here in just a moment um, that's going to show you how there's a huge movement right now to enforce Sunday uh, laws across this country and around the world. Revelation 13, verse 15, I just read that one. Uh, as many as would not worship the image of the beast would be killed. He causes all small and great, rich and poor, a free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Let me talk for a moment about why is it that God's seal is only in the forehead, but the mark of the beast is in the forehead or the hand. Well, there's a. if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, God said that he wanted his people to bind God's law as a frontlet between their eyes. What's, what's between your eyes? That's your forehead. He says, and bind it, as, bind it on your right hands, his law. And so you go to Israel today. You ever seen this? You go to Israel, and, or you even see Jewish people today, and they will wrap these things called phylacteries, or teflon, around their arms and around their head. The, the, you ever see a Jewish man has a big black box right here? You see him praying like this with that big black box? <coughs> Inside that black box are scriptures. Specifically, um, the part that says, you know, Hero is or the Lord our God, the Lord is one, you should love the Lord your God. That's in, that's in that box, right? Well, did God intend for them to fulfill the law by putting it in a box on the forehead? No, God wants it in the forehead. And he says that he, in fact, that same passage says, I give you all these words today that they might be in your heart. God wants his law written where? In our hearts. That's the experience he wants us to have. So, but here's the thing. He, he wanted them to also to do it. So he wanted them to believe it, and he wanted them to do it. The same goes today. God wants you to believe him and to obey him, right? Put the scriptures in your mind and do it with your hand, right? That's, your hand represents the work you do. The mind represents the belief you have. Now, that being said, you come to the mark of the beast, and the mark of the beast is either in the forehead or the hand. Why? Because there are going to be a group of people in the last days who believe that Sunday observance is good for humanity. They believe it. 
And these are going to be the pushers. These are going to be the controllers. These are going to be the people that are in society that are making this, these laws happen, where, where, where Congress is going to be passing laws around this nation, around the world, where there's going to be enforcement of the laws that, that, you, that Sunday's good for you. Sunday, and I'll talk about why they're going to believe that here in just a minute. But then there's going to be a lot of people that say, no, no, no. I know the true Sabbath is not Sunday. I know that this is not what God wants me to do. But then the pressure comes on. If you don't go along with it, you can't buy and you can't sell. If you don't go along with it, eventually, we, keep, we read in there, there's eventually a death decree that goes out. Whoever doesn't do this is going to be killed. They're going to threaten you. They're going to threaten your family. They're going to threaten your finances. And so there's going to be people who observe the Sunday laws, not because they believe it, but because they're forced to do it. So the right hand represents the force, the forehead represents the belief. And that's why the seal of God is only in the forehead. God will not have anybody in the last days who are obeying him out of force, out of pressure. Anybody who obeys him, it's going to be out of love and loyalty, not out of a sense of obligation and force. So get the seal of God in your forehead. Never get the mark of the beast, either in your forehead or your hand. By the way, don't worry. When they come to you and try to force the mark of the beast on you until you can't buy or sell, you know what? You have a God who's going to take care of you. The Bible says waters will be given him. His bread will be sure. You claim those promises of God. Jesus says, when I come back to the earth, will I find faith? Will I find f faith in the earth? He's, he's asking that question. Will he find it? Well, the answer is uh, up for every one of us to decide. Will he find it in me? God's looking for people who will stand tall when the whole world is bowing down. So there's going to be, like I said, a death decree. Now the question is, can this really happen in our time? Can there really be an enforcement of a religious law? I mean, we live in a country that's a free country, right? In our time, can this really happen? Well, watch this. This is, this is uh, I am, my clicker is just going crazy. Okay. Therefore, also in the particular circumstances of our own time, this is John Paul II, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. So the Pope's official letter to guide the whole church says it's our job as Catholics to make sure we have laws enforcing Sunday. This is a goal of the Roman Catholic Church. It has been and it continues to be. Catechism of the Catholic Church in respecting religious liberty and the common good. This is, so, this is such a an ironic thing. They call it religious liberty, but then they're going to force others to do what they want them to do. It's only, in, in, in the mind of the Roman Catholics, religious liberty is only us having liberty. In respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sundays and the church's holy days as legal holidays. It is time that we demonstrate our Catholic vitality and engage in the public policy debate. We have the power and the people to embark on this movement, a movement that will benefit all Americans. Now, this was back in 1994. Do you know what's happened since 1994? We went in our Supreme Court from having, not, there's nine Supreme Court justices, seven of them are Roman Catholic. We, we, right now, we have a Roman Catholic president, right? We have, and, and I'm just going to tell you, regardless of what you think in, in politics, Whoever, whoever wins, you're still going to have Catholics in the White House. Um, it's just, and you, not just that, you've got, <laughs> it's, it's amazing uh, what people consider themselves, because I, mean, I would tell you not, whew, you know, I always make it my purpose to not get embroiled in politics. It just divides people. It's really never been healthy for a preacher to talk about politics. But as I look at prophecy, I can't help but see Satan is working both angles. You think, you, think, you think the devil, I'm not, I'm not saying, by the way, you shouldn't do, work your conscience and vote your best. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying prophecy is going to be fulfilled whoever gets in office. Do you understand this? Okay. We can't think that man has the solution to humanity's problems. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Okay. So just keep that in mind. What about this Roman, Roman uh, Catechism, 1985? The civil authority should be urged to cooperate with the church in maintaining and strengthening this public worship of God, and su to support with their own authority the regulations set down by the church's pastor. That's, a, that's a, a euphemism for the Pope. For it is only in this way that the faithful will understand why it is Sunday and not the Sabbath day we keep holy. It says they're not going to get it until we enforce it. 
They're not going to understand this until we make it into a law and make people keep Sunday. This is what's coming down the pipeline, friends. Bible prophecy is very clear in this matter. And let me just say, um, touching on another issue that's very hot topic today, there's a lot of people who are coming in this country uh, in not the right way that the pre predominant, great predominant religion is Catholic. And there is a major, you think about that for a little bit, I'm going to keep moving. Um, here's something that happened here in uh, the European Union. They were turning to the Pope uh, over what was going on throughout the European Union. They're saying the Pope has the answers. In fact, I, just, I didn't have time. I was thinking about, oh, I need, to put, I need to update some slides. There are some things that's happened just in the last few months where the Pope is winning the world over on, uh, he, as a moral leader. And he's already done a lot. But even more now, here's what Joseph Muscat, he's the Prime Minister of Malta, he said, I do think that Pope Francis is the ultimate world leader that within the circumstances has the skills and vision to say things that transcend the obvious banali and banalities we say, we all say in politics. And so in Europe right now, there is movements to enforce Sunday laws. In fact, uh, there's one European, Euro European Sunday Alliance working throughout. And do you know in Poland right now? They're, they have like a three-year plan. I think it's coming up on the third year where they were shutting down all work on Sundays throughout the country of Poland. Sunday law. I got a friend who lives in Poland, and uh, he's their, their Sunday laws are being enforced over there with penalties for violating them. And and I'll say this as well. There are in politics. There's there's kind of there's there's two fractions. You got the religious right. You got the liberal left. Right. On the religious right. Christians are the quickest often who are to say we should have Sunday for moral reasons. We're going to see a video in just a moment that's going to highlight that. But even on the left, you think, oh, these people don't care about Sunday, but watch what happens. But there's this climate change agenda. is one of the biggest agendas in the world right now being pushed hard. You know, at the top of the line on that, one of the things they say we can save this planet is having a green Sunday. A Sunday where everybody is resting, where the factories are shut down, no more pollution on Sundays, cars are not out on the roads to a great degree, everything's kind of calmed down. And, and in fact, they go back to COVID. And they say COVID proved that, pop, that, that pollution went way down. After they had all those lockdowns around the entire world, they were measuring the pollutants. And they said the pollutants went way down when nobody was out doing anything. We can have that every day, 52 times a year. Every Sunday, we can shut things down and this can go a long ways to reducing carbon emissions and other things. And so guess who's on board on the Sunday agenda? Those who aren't even religious. Sunday is being respected even in Israel, among the Jews, among, in Muslim countries. They're establishing Sunday laws, saying basically that, you know, respect Sundays in those countries. But what about Protestants? Protestants who say, we believe in the Bible. Protestants say, we don't follow traditions, man. We follow the Bible. What about them? Are they going to unite with the beast power in urging for Sunday legislation? I think the answer is yes. And I'm going to show a video to you here. I'm hoping that you guys can hear us. I'm going to be very quiet. And I may even set my microphone close by here. I want you to hear this. Nice and it's just whatever. It's the soul that is corrupt. And how we get back. You guys can't hear that. I have not tested this in advance. All right. All right, let me try this. I'm going to start this over. I'm going to put that, my microphone up to the speaker on this TV. And how we get back to a moral rebirth in this country, I don't know, since we are slowly eroding religion at every opportunity that we have. Probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday to see if we can get back. Okay, I'm just going to tell you what she said. Sorry about that. Okay, so essentially, let me just tell you what she said. This is Sylvia Allen. She's a senator out in Arizona. There's a stabbing. This kid was stabbed. And they, they were saying, we got to create some laws. we got to do something to, to deal with the moral uh, 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 crisis in our country today. She said, we should be debating a bill to enforce Sunday to, for people to go to churches of their choice. 
Right? You got a choice. They're not, they're not enforcing you to go to any certain church. You don't have to go to the Catholic church, but they want you, to, they're going to enforce Sunday keeping. That is her goal. That's her idea. And frankly, this is being this was debated back in the 1800s. It was called the Blair Bill. It was in the United States Senate. They wanted the entire country to be keeping Sunday. In fact, they had Sunday laws in this country. You heard them, they're called blue laws. Even was it um, are you are you allowed to buy a car on Sundays here in this country in, in the state of Arkansas? Um, I don't think you can. I know Missouri, you can't. I, I was buying a car from uh, a friend up there, and, and he, has a, he has a dealership, and he's like, well, we're going to have to post-date this check because I can't sell you a car on Sunday. That's the law. And so it's still there today, and, uh, and while there are those that, you know, trying to less, you know, normally the corporations, the, the big money-making companies, they want to keep their shops open on Sunday, but there's a demand right now for Sundays, for things to be shut down on Sundays. And so it says, they worship the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And so the last issue is over worship. But how does this beast get the whole world to worship? Is it even possible in the last days? In my next session, I'm going to show you how this is going to be enforced around the world, and it's going to make a lot of sense to you. So the Sabbath is the last day of test of loyalty and true worship. We know the seventh day is the Sabbath. We know the first day is the counterfeit Sabbath, and Satan is doing his best to get people on his side because there will be a line drawn. There will be the sheep and the goats. There will be the wheat and the tares. There's going to be two classes of people. Well, those are the mark of the beast. Those are the seal of God. And friends, I'm appealing to you tonight to make sure that you are prioritizing what's right with God and refusing to get the mark of the beast. It's not going to be as simple as, uh, no, thank you. It's going to be a matter of choice. Who will you obey? Who's, who has your loyalty? Go back to the Garden of Eden. It, was, it, wasn't about, it wasn't about a piece of fruit. And frankly, it's not about a day today. It's about us obeying God, doing what He says, taking Him at His word. If you're observing Sunday and that's the day the Pope made holy, are you not worshiping Him? Remember that number 666? Remember that? That number 666, Vicarious Philae Day. That represents the, uh, the authority that the Pope takes to himself to say, I've got the power to change God's law. That's what he says. It's not the mark of the beast, but he's the one who has the power to, he's the one who's been given authority. I shouldn't say that. I guess he is given authority by the dragon to enforce this mark of the beast. The Pope, he's the head of the papacy. He's the one who claims to be the vicar of the Son of God, the authority to change God's law. We know it adds up to 666. We went over this the other night. If you missed this message, go back to my message about um, unmasking the Antichrist in 666. I went over this in great detail. But the Pope's name adds up to 666. Now, I don't know if this guy here, Pope John, or this is Pope Francis, I don't know if he's going to be the one that's going to be majorly involved in, in uh, enforcing the mark of the beast because um, he's old. He's about to die. I don't know who this Pope's going to be, this next one, but you keep your eyes open. And watch what's happening. I don't know why Time Magazine would put him on the cover with a couple, the M, sticking out like horns out of his head. Anyway, you ever notice that? But I'm just making this point that if you obey the Pope, this is a true, true this is a magazine, this is, not, I didn't, this is not edited, okay? But if you obey the Pope, you're obeying the decrees of the Catholic Church. If you obey the Pope and the decrees of the Catholic Church, you're really obeying the one who set it up originally, which is Satan himself. So the question at the end of time is, who will you worship? Will you accept and submit to God's sovereignty, or will you submit to the sovereignty of the Pope? Remember, it's not a matter of one day over another. It's not a matter, but it is a matter of authority and loyalty. I think I appreciate what my sister said earlier. When we're not worshiping God, we're really worshiping ourselves. We're setting up our own opinions as a, as a God. Jesus really was upset when, he, when, the, when the Pharisees kept doing this. They started setting up the traditions of man. He said, you have made of no effect the commandments of God by your tradition. So soon, church and state is going to unite to undermine our freedoms. So I'm asking you tonight to make your decision. Now, I, I don't have a lot of time left. I'm going to go to one passage in the Bible that is really, really interesting. It's in the book of 2 Kings. Um, actually, I think it's 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings 12, there's a story in the Old Testament where uh, you guys are familiar, I'm, I don't I want to take too much time to give you the history of this, but you know, King Saul, 
he was not the best king. Then came King David. David did a pretty good job. After David died, Solomon took over. And Solomon, you know, he, was, he did an all right job. God really prospered Solomon's reign, even though he wasn't the best guy. Uh, around the end of his life, he, he repented. Saul, or sorry, uh, Solomon had a son. His name was Rehoboam. Rehoboam, he said, you know what? I'm going to make it harder than even my dad did. And because of that, the people rebelled. And this is what split Israel and Judah. It t- ten, of the ten, 10 of the 12 tribes stayed to the north. Two tribes stayed to the south, and the Levites, right? So you have Benjamin and Judah to the south. They became what we know today as Judah. And then you had Israel to the north. Those were the other 10 tribes. Well, there was a guy by the name of Jeroboam. So you got Rehoboam, son of Solomon, and Jeroboam. Je- I think son of what, Nephat? I can't remember his last name. Anyway, Jeroboam, he was, became basically the king of the north. Are you with me so far? Jeroboam, he was at first, God put him in his place. God gave him the authority over the ten tribes. But he took, he got scared. He got really worried about his authority. And here's what happened. I'm going to read the story here. This is 1 Kings chapter 12. It says, Jeroboam, this is verse 25. Jer- 1 Kings 12, 25. Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. And he went out from there and built Peniel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. He was very insecure. He was afraid that the ten tribes is going to go back to to Rehoboam. If these, verse 27, if these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, then this heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. What was he worried about? That they were going to go back to Jerusalem and their loyalty would return back to Rehoboam. Therefore the king asked advice and made two calves of gold and said to the people, It's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan, that's at the north, and he made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not the sons of Levi. Are you with me so far? He's doing everything he can to counterfeit the true worship of God because he wanted, he wanted people to stay in his kingdom and not go to God's kingdom, okay? Verse 20, or 32. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month. Remember, God's feast was on the 7th month. This is, an, this is a feast on the 8th month. Keep this in mind like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. Keep notice that he had made, he had made. This is man-made worship. Verse 33. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. You see here, Satan's strategy, working through Jeroboam, was to counterfeit the true day of worship that God told them. God told them this is the day of worship. They counterfeited it by doing it on the, not the seventh month, but the eighth month. Satan said that strategy was so successful, I'm going to do it again. He got the early church to set apart not the seventh day of the week, but the eighth day. In fact, you go read early Christian literature, they called the first day of the week the eighth day. You see it all through there. The eighth day, even though it was the first day of the week, you know, they, it was eight days. And, I, and I'm telling you, friends, Satan knew this would, strategy would work, and sure enough, it did. It got people's minds. Because if you could break God's law this much right here, then what big deal is it if you break it this much? If you're going to If you're going to break from loyalty to God this much, then breaking from loyalty to God and a large amount, is not really that big a deal. Friends, I'm telling you right now, we need to come to the place in our own personal experience where loyalty means everything, where faithfulness to God is above my connection with my family, with my friends, with my church, with my government. Loyalty to God means above all of that. And watch, you may have to sacrifice, but God will give you even more abundantly when you follow Him. My appeal to you tonight is will you make your decision to stay firm and loyal to God despite whatever pressures come in the world, whatever the mark of the beast is, which I think we know what the mark of the beast is now, to make your decision to say, I want the seal of God. I do not want the counterfeit. Anybody here want the seal of God and not the counterfeit? Praise, I pull those hands just shot up. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. you got a double hand in the back. I appreciate that. 
Let God write His law in your hearts and minds, and that's how you get the seal of God. Let's pray for that just now. My Father in heaven, I want to thank You for Your holy law, that You've given it to guide us in the paths of righteousness. You've given us Your commandments to keep us away from evil, from displeasing You, to guard us from sin and wickedness, from trouble. But Lord, we have been tricked and deceived in this world, and we're praying, Lord, to restore us to the paths of righteousness, to restore us to the right way. Help us, Lord, choose you at every turn, no matter what anybody else does, to be loyal to you. We invite you to come into our hearts just now. Thank you very much. And Lord, before we close this prayer, I want to give you a special thanks for the food we're about to partake of. As we break to eat and enjoy fellowship with one another, God, be with us. Be with our fellowship. I thank you for the, the, the servants of yours that have uh, prepared this food and have set it out. May we eat to your honor. May we eat to your glory. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. All right. Jenny, any instructions tonight? Oh, yes. That would be really good. If, if you guys want to, um, the front table here can turn around to that table. If you guys want to turn around to the other table, you can. And uh, that, try to sit at the table with the tablecloths. How about that? And have your food. That way, any messes can be easily cleaned up. And uh, you can get to know your neighbor. Um, also, I think tonight we're going to do the round circle. So go through, the, go through the left over there and come on around and uh, get your food. We already had the blessing, so go eat. And let's do it fast because we're going to get started about 7 o'clock to 7.05 or so.